I'm John Anderson. I work as the vice president for product development at Stille in Sweden. Uh, I'll do a really quick introduction to, to the company itself. We are a fairly old company. We started in 1841. And uh, so we actually, we have delivered surgical instruments to uh, I think for everything from the, the civil war of the US and onwards. So we still do uh, these uh, tools are still done manually by forging and, and uh, grinding to, to create the scissors, the forceps and, and pincers and so on. And that's one leg of it. And the other leg is uh, our surgical tables. These are more a robotic version of a table that um, positions the patient in conjunction with a x-ray device such as a c-arm and, and this creates a, a really fast and secure way to do minimal invasive surgery uh, together with x-ray machinery um, i did a, a small a, a really quick um, recap of what i've done a small collection of projects uh, so up in the left corner there is a cancer treatment machinery to let you uh, keep your hair during chemotherapy the other one is a cancer treatment machinery for prostate cancer through laser and light therapy we've done a automatic reader for uh, the fadia in the cap uh, like allergy tests. I've done um, a control system for high speed trains and control systems for um, uh, large offshore high voltage direct current uh, power transfers. And then I get, got back to Stille for, for creating these wonderful tables. So that's a, a short introduction of myself. Um, I'm a system engineer, um, specialized in software in the beginning, but uh, mainly work with product management and the system engineering throughout my career. So um, uh, where do we come from and why do we try to use model-based system engineering or system engineering in any way or form creating our products? Uh, as you all know, the medical device domain is highly regulated through, through documentation and, and um, regulatory requirements. Um, got the requirements, the risk management, the sign descriptions, the verification, validation activities. You all know this. And a quick tree of, of stuff that needs to be done, previously done all manually with Word and Excel creating the traceability matrices and so on pretty much by hand which during the development phase is fairly okay but as soon as you say that you got the new requirement or or a test phase so you need to rework something the work that goes into the traceability and the change uh, investigations of what's affected by that it takes forever and uh, the third party certified notified body, they don't really care about fancy tools and so on. They want everything printed and signed and you need to sit there with them holding their hands and, and go through every single step of it. Um, what we see, we got a class one product according to the standard. Um, getting it to the US market requires a UL or ETL certificate to get out onto the hospitals from our side. And uh, the lead time to get to that point is somewhere around 12 months. And the cost is substantial to that. And why is this? How can it have become that we had previously, we had somewhere around four months and maybe uh, 70k dollars roughly today we 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 have a much higher degree what, what i've seen is this is due to the minimal understanding of the product 
from the notified body point of view. So how did we do to fix this? Uh, we created our single source of truth, which means that uh, the Capella model, which is, well, it's a modeling tool. You can use any kind of modeling tool. You can use Enterprise Architect. You can use uh, what's built in into the IBM suite or, or whatever. Um, our Capella tool is integrated together with doors, with, um, with our software development tools and, and so on, the ECAD. But we pull all our documents out from the data model, uh, which means that as soon as you have released a document and it's signed, that is from the regular point of truth, that, that's your golden sample of that documentation. In reality, it comes as an export from the tool that we use. Uh, in the bottom, we have doors, next generation or, or jazz. I, I don't know what you call it in the US, but we try to call it doors next generation. Uh, I think they, they themselves call it jazz, but uh, that's it. That's what we do, our risk management, our requirement management, and also test and verification. So we got that traceability, but the requirement themselves are not good enough for someone to understand how to produce a system. Uh, so this is just to show that um, we in our in the doors domain, we on the left, we have all the uh, risk management templates that we use connected to different types of, of regulatory uh, standards. And on the right side, we, we got the requirement spec where it sits. Uh, and these are linked together with each other. Um, if we take one requirement, it's broken down into several subsystem requirements on the software side. And in the Capella model, um, we have a small requirement box here, which is that requirement broken down onto the model and that is then distributed onto our models we're linking requirements to model elements um, and um, when we work with this tool uh, we, why did we use capella we can start there. Uh, there are many tools out there that can do the same thing. Uh, when I was in General Electric doing HVDC systems, we went with um, uh, Enterprise Architect because that was cheap, easy to use, and people knew roughly how it worked. What we found, what I found, is that it doesn't enforce a methodology because the methodology itself allow, or the tool allow you to break the methodology without warning you in any way or form. Uh, when, we, when I came to Stille, I thought, if this is a problem, let's find a tool that actually has a, a rigid uh, methodology. And that's the Arcadia methodology, which means that you can't draw whatever you want, however you want to do it. So it, it defines you to go through some steps. Uh, of course, you can break it when you know how to do it, uh, but then you do it a active decision to let's skip that stage and just go straight onto this stage. But at least you by then know why you're doing that. Um, what we usually start with is trying to, to model how will this operating table look like? So we got users from the operating room. We got a patient. We got a table. Okay, that table has a control system that consists of input devices, uh, motors, and so on. I haven't fleshed out everything in, into the models because I'm guessing some legal entity will be upset by then. Yeah. So I'm trying to keep it 
fairly uh, without breaking any IP rules. Um, we look at the capabilities, what is actually important here. So the operational capability is patient positioning. What do we need to do for that? Um, this gives someone a, a rough estimate. Okay, this is the top level. If you break it down to like, uh, uh, yes, I want to use that joystick and, and I want to control the hydraulic system. So, so that is a, a simple data flow. Whoops. It's a simple data flow for how does the joystick work? And also the requirements in the system connected to that model, what is expected of the joystick, okay? That is used for positioning the patient. What can I do with this? I, I can um, move the patient in conjunction with the CM, modeling the height, um, the translation in X and Y, which means panning uh, the lateral and, and longitudinal the trending. I can do isocentric tilt and Trendelenburg. Okay, for that, um, one of the requirements that we don't see here is that we need to be able to move patient with um, a weight of 627 pounds. Um, to do that on a low foot, footprint, uh, we look at hydraulics. Okay, how will the hydraulic work? So. Uh, the hydraulic control system also has a brake system that needs to be interacted. Uh, looking at it in the bigger picture, we, we still do have that, the same requirement here. Looking at the system architecture on a top level uh, in the control centers, it's a joystick. We have a touch screen, the requirements for the touch screen, the hydraulic control system, the requirements for that. And um, uh, the, also the same requirement sits with the, the motor control system. Uh, and we have visual feedback. And so you can start by looking at the system in this um, way. If you use VCO to do this, it's great. The problem is that when you break it down, you have to redraw pretty much everything. Here you can translate it down to the next level and start working on the logical architecture from there. Um, what we also usually do, we do functional chains, which means that it's easy to understand what elements are affected by these chains. So if you have motorized movement for joystick, it's the blue one, so that, that path, and the, through hydraulic is the red path share the same brake system, they share the same splitter and the same joystick. So uh, what I'm trying to show here is that on a system level, we can ad attach requirements to model elements, making the um, requirement spec visible, not just 851 system requirement entries which when you read four pages, you have no clue how everything sits together. You know that these are requirements and they have to be fulfilled, but what does that mean in the bigger picture? So this is trying to visualize the requirements. And the same way, if you have a, a graphical representation of a system without requirements, you can still turn up with a, a highly sophisticated toaster and not a operating table. It depends on how you look at that picture. Um, state machines can attach requirements to the state machines. So this is going from an idle to a movement request. And when you want to do a move request, you need to check the table positioning if the brake system allows it to do. And here you can see the Trinilbant movement should only be available if the tabletop is in zero position. And what is zero position? Minus two to plus two degrees. If it's not, exit. If it's okay, execute position until you get there and show it on a display and then back to idle. So 
uh, it's not just model elements. You can also do it to to your state machines, and you can take your state machines and add those into sequence diagrams to flesh out the sequence diagrams. And yeah, well, you can dive how deep you want. We wanted to stay fairly high for the first projects, not to because you can model yourself to death. That's very simple. And then we go into the physical architecture, which means that, okay, we have a touch screen that communicates over the USB. We've got requirements that sits and tells us. So once again, you get a picture for, for your hardware. And this is a very simplified version of that hardware, but still, uh, I made the actual PCBs green so people with an electronics background, because otherwise, so, so everything is yellow. What does that mean? Okay, if it's, if it's a green, it's actually a PCB board. Um, but here you can connect your, your system functions uh, onto deployment, onto a, a physical component and how that communicates through the physical wires and so on. So that gives, at least it gives us a, a very good image. And we usually take that with us when we go to, to our cert notified body or certification test house. When they are so, so how does this system work? And you start producing these kind of images instead of writing an email that's uh, a small essay and they don't really get it anyway. And you have to redo that exercise over and over and over. And especially now with Corona, where you where we couldn't go to the test facility and be with them during the tests, everything had to be done remote and it became challenging. So with these kind of images, together with the requirements and, and they're starting to understand how this documentation works rather than just having a, a bunch of requirements and uh, testing against the uh, regulatory standards, like 6601 standard, for example. So if we start to summarize slightly uh, on the Capella side, uh, this is actually from a snippet from the tool where one can see uh, Last year's project, uh, a new. These are different projects, and this is the one that we that I created for this one. Um, but what we see that you can actually see the requirements inside of uh, of um, the the model itself, and this is actually imported from doors. So it's a rec if import into this. I know that. Um, OBO has made a, a recently has made a, a brilliant add-on that bridges between Capella and uh, Doors Next Generation. Uh, I haven't tried it out yet, but uh, it's it's on my Christmas list. Um, and the different layers, the operational, got the requirements on the system level and requirements on a logical level and the, the different logical requirements that sits in there as well. Um, so for us, Capella has uh, not just through the development phase, because it has improved our own understanding of, of the product immensely. Uh, we have saved so many hundred thousand dollars on not being forced into the fifth meeting of why is the brake control system uh, triggering before the clutch of the the motor and and why is the cr not being able to request the movement before this and this and this um my system engineer every time she gets into those meetings she pulls up a a picture of um, what that stakeholder group decided on the first meeting saying that this is what we decided about. This is the visualization of it. 
do you want to change anything? And they usually mutter a bit and then they go away saying, no, it's the same thing still. Um, and in a few weeks ago, they, they're going to come back with a new request for such a meeting. And she pulls up the same picture again. And the meeting is over in a few minutes rather than sitting hours and hours and hours and just going through the same discussion. Um, of course, we have been forced to educate the notifying body or the certification test houses. Um, because when you come with such a thing and you say, this is what we do, and they're not really used to it, uh, their first reaction is, no, that's not good enough. And then you start feeding them the, the images and the model. Of course, they, they do not install the model and read native in the tool. But since we're exporting documents from it, they're starting to grasp the, the fundamentals of it, at least. So we're training them in reading the models uh, for ourselves. And then they're starting to understand how the requirement maps to the, the models, to the code reviews, to the verification, and back to the risk, the closing of the risk mitigation action. Um, it's a bit of a hassle to get the documentation from the model in the beginning because it's a bit of a, well, you need to invest some time and, and energy to it. So, uh, but that has been really good. Um, because it it looks the same every time now, um, and the traceability, as I said, is still created inside of Doors Next Generation. So we still do our test and verification in that tool and show show it to to the notified body how this is done on the test house, I should say. Um, so we can actually say that this is the risk that we have in the in the 6601-1-2 standard for electromagnetic safety. Uh, this is the risk, this is the requirement for that, this is the test case, and this is the test report, and all linked inside of the tool. Uh, and that's where we actually start making progress, because since we develop operating tables, when you look at electromagnetic and the mechanical safety, they kind of tend to look the same every single time. Uh, the requirements are the same, the test methods are the same, and uh, we can start reusing this and shortening the delivery time of our projects. And, and also the, the certification test houses starting to grasp the power of the tools as well. Um, I'm ending with two, um, two uh, quotes from George Box said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, and uh, Frank Tugger said, listening to both sides of a story will convince you that is more than a story to both sides. This is what, um, when I took the course on the Capella, uh, this is what he started with. Uh, so we, we, when you do model-based system engineering, you need to really think of your models uh, because, as I said, you can't get the models perfectly right. Because to get to that point, you need to model and model and model. And if you're lucky, uh, the reality doesn't change and you can keep modeling. But the question is, when is it good enough? When, do you, when does the model become useful? That's, that's one of the key takeaways. Um, yeah, and thank you for attending and listening to this. Thank you, John. Uh, Any questions? Okay. Thank you, thank you John. This, this is great. Um, that's the one here. Um, and that slide you do, you, that you show the physical architecture, one concern I have there is um, mixing. This is, this is something I've seen, and independent of what tool we use, whether it's Capella or 
doors or whatever you want to use. Well, the concern I have with when mixing a design detail, like the actual physical PCB, like what, how they're separated. And let's say you have three PCBs there, but yeah. you're showing a design, you're showing something that is pretty much a design output, design detail. It seems like you have to have that compromise because, um, Correct me if I'm wrong. Do you, do you get do you have the situation where you have an electrical engineer suddenly come up with a block diagram, and you, of what they understand of the system? Yes. So so basically, uh, when when we do this, uh, when we've defined the system requirements and and the big overview like. Uh, uh, this one, because this one doesn't really talk about software, hardware, PCBs, cables. This talks about capabilities. From there, we, we derive, uh, um, derive the logical part of it, and then we go into the physical part. Uh, because w when we say that, well, we need to be able to display, okay, what does we mean to display? Okay, we want to have a screen, yes. Is it a touch screen? So, so the model itself grows with the design and the requirement. Uh, to get to this point, you have your electrical engineer. Uh, he's going to be looking at uh, this Cortex A8. It has a shitloads of ins and outs and, and ports and uh, interfaces. Uh, and he, he draws what goes where and so on. Um, but somewhere you need to to digest this. Of course, that that block diagram is also a part of the design. Yes, uh, you can model everything inside of it. Uh, for this, I didn't do that. But uh, in in our live project, uh, my my modeling manager, she's actually done. Um, not all the components uh, for like the galvanic isolations and so on, but in terms of, of uh, every single port of the, the baseboard that's connected outside. But, but I, do, I do get your, your, your question uh, because uh, the model grows as the design grows. Is that uh, still confused, but on a higher level? So I understand. I just I would caution you when doing physical architecture to not jump at design and output. Um, try, I mean, I, it seems like there's a compromise here, but it's, it's fine. I deal with that all the time where I have to, I would say accept the, take the perspective of the, how the other engineers would actually decompose the system and get to have, have some middle ground with them um, and not try to impose my perception. Um, I think the important thing is uh, what, do you feel that you have achieved a better collaboration with your engineers using tools like this? Yes, so um, the people who, who actually uh, love it is, uh, is uh, the software guys and the electronic guys. Because someone is actually taking their, their designs and their thoughts, the software architecture isn't just sitting in, in VCO or, or PowerPoint or whatever tool they're using. It might be a UML diagram, but it actually goes into the data model. Uh, and they owning that part of it. So, so they do their modeling inside of the tool. Uh, in terms of, of uh, collaborations between different um, um, technical areas, so, so to say, uh, I think the mechanical guys are the ones that um, might be not really... Uh, working inside of the tool in terms of that but what we kind of do add uh, mass variables to each different component and and understanding stuff like that as well into it 
Well, that's good. What I'm pretty, um, what I like with your comment, well, you mentioned that you already have presented this sort of uh, diagrams to regulatory bodies, agencies, yeah. right? Well, that's pretty good. Which regulatory body in particular? We're using Intertech. Intertech. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. It's very good. I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Okay. And then we have something from... Uh... From faith, is there a bi-directional link between the requirements in doors and the capella? Um, the way we have used it now, it's an export from doors through RecIF interface into capella. Um, Stefan, I, I'm guessing your bridge has a bi-directional. Uh, yes, so Capella is also um, a platform which you can extend uh, with with add-ons and stuff like that. And we have a commercial product which is called uh, Publication for Capella, and and that's bringing an OSLC a connection to Capella where you, we we can bring data back and forth from various ALMs and and doors and G is is one of them. So that's uh, that would be on the commercial on the commercial product that you would get this bi-directional yeah. links yeah but as i said that that's on my christmas list uh for this and and then uh, the requirement in the demo seems to be free format text uh, when, when you import them you get the same text as what you have in in uh, indoors today in the rec if uh, you can put parameters to it you can put um, extensions to it you can put constraints and so on so it is uh, it's a powerful tool uh, but as with all tool, uh, you get what you put into it. And yeah, maybe uh, an addition to, to this second question, uh, uh, which is indeed you can uh, import the requirements, you can add attributes to the requirements. Um, the question was also, can you make the requirement as uh, parameters or functions or components or things like that. So what you can do with Capella as well is you can add your own uh, attributes to component functions or to any other uh, elements. So that's another way if you want to manage some of the, the requirements values and, and assign them on, on each uh, function or components of your system. So that's another possibility to uh, to link with requirements. Mm. I'd like to follow on with the comment about, about using the models as regulatory evidence. Chris Unger put up something in the chat about this. And John, I think you said you are showing models to regulators. I'd like to hear from everybody in the group here. So I'm going to launch a Zoom poll asking <laughs> you, do you use models as regulatory evidence? Are you using models, but you extract documents like John described at the beginning? or you're not using models at all and therefore not relevant. Can I, can I add like this just another regarding fit. that? Um, so we do, there is one model we always present all the time and people, and they're not really aware it's a model. <laughs> uh, it's the, <laughs> look, and um, the one is the, uh, in, the isolation diagram that's presented as part of conformance to 60601-1. It is a model, but we never say it. <laughs> um, and that's presented all the time because it's, 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 it's mandated. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So here's the, the results of the poll. I just cut it off with only 13 responses, but uh, most are extracting documents like what you, what you described because that's kind of our habit, what regulators are used to. But I'm hoping so that's kind changing. Of a, uh, fourth, Kelly, we're using models, but we're submitting documents that are inspired by the models, but they're not extracted <laughs> from them. Interesting. So we're using yeah. them as design tools, but not directly related to regulatory submissions. Interesting approach. That's a way to get started. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Okay, and then um, I was in MBS workshop. Chris, can you elaborate on that? Uh, I mean, it was a long time ago. I think it was uh, somebody did consultation, and I think it was in transportation, some of like the rail safety. 
Um, and he just yeah. said that when either the OEM and suppliers, vendors to the OEM were doing reviews, or when the OEM was working with vendors, I mean, with the regulators, same thing you commented. Instead of doing a three hour review, is this document right? They took 30 minutes to train the regulator and how to analyze one or two, like an activity diagram or a, whatever, you know, just one or two and said, hey, now that you've been trained for 20 minutes, let's review the rest of the document. And the total review time was less and they found more. Mm. So they, to your point about the training, the training pays for itself. It's not an added burden. Yep. And then Salis, uh, what about SysML v2 compatibility? Uh, I'm going to let Stefan ask, answer that. The, the reason we went with the uh, Capella, uh, as I said, uh, I had a, quite a junior team on this. Uh, so I wanted them to have a strict methodology, which forced them to do all the steps uh, and to validate their models uh, in that way, teaching them as well how to do it. Um, I, I'm, um, for me, SysML or, or Arcadia methodology is not a, a religious piece of work. It's a, the Arcadia model was the best for that junior team for me. Uh, Stefan, how about SysML V2 compatibility? Yes. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, just to make things clear, yeah, Arcadia and Capella are not uh, uh, compatible with uh, CSML. They are not using the CSML language uh, directly. It's it's inspired by CSML. It's it's close to CSML, but it's not it's not CSML compliant. Uh, so there there are bridges to, to bring Capella model back and forth from CSML v1 and uh, about CSML v2. Uh, there are people and organization working on it, uh, but I can't say much more about it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then the UML and CSMN models linked. Um, they, um, I know you can draw UML models, um, freehand UML models inside of it. Um, we use it sometimes, but usually we go in the logical architecture and, and draw the, uh, the software architecture in there. And then we, when we go into the actual coding of it, we, we use UML as a free base inside of the Capel. So, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what uh, UML parts you're using, uh, uh, John, but um, uh, in Capella you have um, different types of diagrams and uh, so you have these kind of diagrams you are seeing right now which, which we call architecture diagrams and that, that uh, are mainly showing the uh, component breakdowns of, of, of the model uh, but then we have diagrams which are much closer to the UML uh, ones and, and, and mainly you, you're going to be able to model uh, all the data uh, that that yeah, you, flows. You get you get class diagrams that you can use. So yeah, yeah. So so it's mainly the class diagram that you can use to uh, mm. uh, to draw uh, the, the the classes, the data structures, uh, and and then those classes and data structures are connected to uh, other elements in, in in your model. So they would flow. They would mainly flow uh, in the components exchanges or the function exchanges. Um, 